I thought I'd take a prerogative, um, my prerogative, to tell my story since we have seven minutes left, I guess, since we have so. So, um, there's one project that I'm particularly proud of that has been ongoing for almost 30 years now, funded for almost 30 years now. Um, and that's air quality forecasting. So if you've ever heard of a code red or a code orange smog alert in Atlanta or anywhere in Georgia, um, that's coming from me and a team of, of forecasters that I work with. Um, it all started in 1995. Um, there was this meeting that was called by the Metropolitan Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. The Olympics were coming in 1996. The Chamber of Commerce was scared to death that there were gonna be athletes on the infield of what became Turner Field, uh, Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Olympic Stadium, scared to death that there were gonna be athletes that were doubled over having asthma attacks. And the reason was because back then, there were 153 days in the summer between May 1st and September 30th. About 100 of those days would have not met air quality standards by today's standards. So two out of every three days in the summertime in Atlanta didn't meet air quality standards. And the world was gonna be watching and the Metropolitan Atlanta Chamber was scared to death. So they called everybody in the region who did anything with air quality and they said, can we fix air quality, at least for the Olympics? And we all looked at our shoes and tried to not make eye contact and said, you know, essentially, no, uh, we're, get, we're gonna be screwed. We're gonna be in a big mess here. And so then they said, well, can we at least predict air quality or tell people when, it, when it's going to be bad? And um, nobody said anything for a long while. And then I, I said, yeah, sure, I think we can do it. I'll do it. Um, I was in my fifth out of seventh year of graduate school at that time. Um, and Chamber said, yeah, hey, great. We'd, we'd, we'd love for you to do that. Um, nobody else said anything. And then I got back to the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences here at Georgia Tech. And the chair of the school called me into the office and said, what the heck are you doing? you're gonna ruin all our credibility in terms of uh, our, our, our scientific research uh, bona fides and all that. And I think I said something stupid in return. And, and anyway, uh, 30 years later, we were still forecasting air quality um, in, in, in that way. Um, when we started, uh, we weren't very good at, at forecasting air quality. Um, and in fact, um, but we didn't have to be very good because two out of every three days was a, 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 a bad event day. So um, it was almost, you could just say, every day this summer is going to be a bad air quality day and you'd be 66% right. Um, the other problem was is that um, the state of Georgia created these opportunities where businesses and industries and schools could do something on days that we call the smog alert. So, um, and, and they didn't tell them what to do because this was a voluntary program. So they, uh, but the state of Georgia actually got one and a half percent emissions credit. Um, and at that time we needed every 10th of a, uh, uh, a percent of, of credit we could get to, to lower our emissions, partly because the Department of Transportation had taken away all of Atlanta's funding for highway funding for those few years. Um, and until we started lowering our emissions, we weren't gonna get it back. So they were s scrapping for every little, every little thing they could get. But we had um, industries, I think, uh, um, couple big brand names uh, around the corner here. Uh, they said things like, well, we're going to offer free soda um, during lunchtime so that our employees don't go out to, don't get in their cars and go out and drive uh, uh, in the middle of the day, creating more air quality problems. And schools were saying, well, we're gonna cancel recess and we're gonna cancel all the after school outdoor activities, you know, kinds of things. Um, and that went on for a year or two. And then our friends over in the public health school and Rollins School of Public Health and the uh, CDC said, you know, I don't think health is getting better by offering free soda and canceling exercise, opportunities to exercise for kids in some way. So 
uh, we had to work with a lot of different um, uh, agencies, organizations. How do we develop a better message around air quality forecasting in some way? Um, so that took a few years. We developed some guidelines, some support, um, kept moving forward. Air quality was getting better, by the way. Um, we were getting better at sort of understanding what are the local things that were impacting air quality and being able to predict them. We had to understand sort of the weather. The weather is the biggest, biggest uh, 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 factor in terms of what kind of air quality that we're going to have the next day. But we also had to understand what are 4 million, 5 million, 6 million people around Metro Atlanta doing every day. What are they doing different on Mondays versus Wednesdays versus Saturdays or Sundays? Um, and were they doing it upstream of, up, upwind of Atlanta or downwind of Atlanta? Where were those impacts going to happen? So you kind of had to start to understand that. And we started to get a pretty good handle on it. And probably by the mid-2000, early 2000s, we were hitting our stride pretty good. We, we, we were forecasting air quality really well. Um, then, um, since then, we've started to sort of plateau or maybe even get a little bit worse. And part of the problem is that we're starting to see things further and further away impacting our air quality now. We have to worry about Saharan dust, dust storms that happen off the Africa coast, get into the uh, uh, Atlantic circulation, move all the way across the, the, the Atlantic, and then can impact here. So we, we worry about Saharan dust. Last year, um, the Canadian wildfires. Wildfires that are occurring in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon. These aren't even parts of Canada that are, are provinces. They're still territories. They're so far up there, so far away. Y'all all experienced sort of the air quality that we had here. Predicting where those plumes of smoke that have traveled 2,000, 3,000 miles, um, just how far south they're going to get at any one point in any one day is giving us fits. We're having a hard a heck of a time. So air quality forecasting continues to be business, for me, continues to be uh, an opportunity to uh, improve our understanding of sort of the atmosphere and all the things that uh, affect it. But then it's also had all this um, uh, uh, additional opportunity to understand how people react to our air quality forecasts, what they do, um, a lot of what the forecasting was, it wasn't about the forecast itself, it was about this opportunity to attach these messages um, from the state of Georgia about what our air quality was. Um, that provided a lot of political cover for the state of Georgia to be able to implement a lot of regulatory actions, take things that they wouldn't have normally been able to do in our political climate, the state that we live in, uh, to be able to improve air quality. And I'm proud to say that in 2022, for the first time since 1979, the state of Georgia everywhere is meeting all applicable air quality standards. Um, and so I'm proud to sort of been a part of that, uh, just a little little role in that, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's something that's ongoing and uh, um, we've probably trained probably 40 to 50 forecasters um, over the last 30 years to, to be able to do that. And, we still continue to do it, and uh, the next forecast just came out two minutes ago, if my colleagues uh, uh, had, had done their job. So, um, proud to do that. <laughs>